Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the opening webinar of the Festival Week series of the 2025 initiative. My name is Alexander, and I welcome you on the behalf of the 2025 Initiatives Coordination Group. And as we start our work this coming nine days, actually, uh, it's still December 20th for GMT, and we will be working for the next nine days together as one United World Group. I invite now Claire from New Zealand, for whom it's already December 21st, to lead us in alignment. Good morning, Claire. Hi, good morning, everybody. And welcome to today's webinar with Nicholas Nalen and the 2025 initiative. So my name is Claire and I'm joining our circle today from my daughter's home on Waiheke Island, which is 21.6 kilometers east of Auckland, off the North Island of New Zealand. And from where I'm sitting, I can see the sun rising over the ocean. The hills and the native bush are tinged with orange. And it's already the 21st of December here, as Sasha says. It's the first morning of festival week. This uh, once every seven years event that we've long been preparing for. Today's sunrise sounds a deep high note of promise. It heralds an opportunity long anticipated by the new group of world servers and by all who are working towards a united humanity and lasting peace and goodwill on earth. So we'll do a short alignment before Nicholas speaks to us from India about the astrological and cosmological significance of this week. I invite us all to close our eyes and take our place in the sacred circle. We come together as we do each time we meet in the spirit of unity, dedicating ourselves anew to the privilege of service to humanity. Today, we prepare our collective chalice to receive the festival week blessings. During the seven day festival period, Shambhala, Hierarchy and Humanity come together in potent and unified alignment. We visualize the space as a vast yet intimate circle of receptivity and grace. We withdraw our consciousness from our personality discomforts and distractions and settle deeply and expectantly into each other's presence and into the shared space of the group heart. Together, we breathe in the sense of shared purpose and intention. We know ourselves as individual souls within the greater group soul. meeting as a whole of many parts in a field of lighted love and spiritual will. Mm -hmm. 
we visualize for a moment our planet suspended in space, surrounded by a shimmering network of light. This network is a collaborative art picturing of human and divine love. A mantle of protection whose unbreakable connections span time and distance and at the heart of which we recognize love and the will to good as our common language. This mantle of light lives and breathes in concert with both the heavens and the earth, seeking to synchronize one with the other. As we enter festival week, we envision love in its hierarchical sense, free from sentiment and personal bias. Love that surrenders and seeks to understand that acts with strength and decisiveness. Motivated not by self-interest, but by the well-being of the whole. And we imagine the steady and irreversible illumination of humanity and affirm our earth as a sacred, radiant and peaceful station of light being steadily transformed by love. And to close our alignment, we'll say together the affirmation of love. In the center of all love, I stand. From that center, I, the soul, will outward move. From that center, I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the divine self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group, and throughout the world. Thank you. Opening our work this week, we invite us all to reflect together on the significance of this cycle, of this time, and the energy that we're working with. And Nicholas Snellen um, is one of our long-standing presenters, and uh, during the last seven years, um, there was a series of webinars on the celestial ship where uh, Nicholas invited us to sail with him the heavens. And uh, Nicholas, are you ready to Im invite us on this ship again? And uh, what I understand that you had to travel to India where your sh celestial ship is parked been parked all these years since our last webinar. It's, it so happens, yes, that's true, that's true. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. It's I know it's been an adventure for you to uh, make this happen. So much gratitude from us all and uh, let's do this journey together. Let's begin. Thank you, Alexander, yes. 
Yes, it's been a, a journey here, and uh, I guess the uh, PowerPoint that you will be seeing here uh, was created on the dirt roads of India. So excuse any any jumps that comes through here. It was a jumpy ride, let me tell you. But let's see if I can now show my screen for you. Is that okay, Alexander? You can see it? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, very good. So, uh, the purpose of my little talk today for you uh, is to explore some of the energies behind this uh, festival week. And I'll give you some suggestions as to how my own thoughts have run regarding some of the uh, quotes and statements given by the Tibetan in his uh, work with Alice Bailey. And uh, let's see where we can, what we can get out of that uh, together. But first of all, just to uh, say something about the new group of world servers for which this is the festival week, we can uh, see that the Tibetan tells us that this group, the new group of world servers, serves as Aquarius indicates. And this then is the hierarchy itself, which is represented by Aquarius. So you can say that the group, the new group of world servers, serves as Aquarius or serves as the hierarchy. So it's an extension of the spiritual hierarchy of our planet and a bridging agency between the fifth spiritual kingdom and the fourth kingdom of humanity, primarily. And it said that the group which is speeded upon the upward way is the new group of world servers, and this group is ruled by Taurus, and to it that divine Taurian energy brings illumination and the attainment of the vision. So that's something very marked and specific for this particular group. The illumination and the attainment of the vision. So this group is, figuratively speaking, the bull rushing forward upon a straight line with its one eye fixed upon the goal and beaming light. So these are quite definite and distinct and somewhat occult statements. But those of you who have studied astrology will see many qualities related to the sign Taurus in this description. Taurus is a sign of great light and illumination. And also the idea of movement forward, in this case, rushing forward, is also very much connected to the bull and the Taurus energy. And in a rather undeviating manner, you might say, a straight line because related to Taurus is the first ray planet, the first ray will and power of Vulcan, which is the esoteric and hierarchical ruler of Taurus. So this first ray gives to Taurus, and thus this group of the new group of world servers, the ability to move forward and upon a rather straight line and then the important thing, having one eye fixed upon the goal and thus moving upon a straight line towards that goal whilst beaming light. So the group moves forward 
and at the same time as it is moving towards a destiny goal, it is beaming light. So this is something to deeply consider and ponder and meditate upon, of course. And we just take it in for what it is said at the moment. The goal of the new group of world servers, well, it is the goal of providing a center of light within the world of men and of holding up the vision to the sons of men. The goal of providing a center of light within the world of men. So each member of the new group of world servers individually will have to become and be a center of light wherever he finds himself. And in addition to that, he must seek to hold up the vision as he understands it from the master. And hold that vision to the sons of men. So the mission of the New Group World Service is to receive and transmit illumination from the Kingdom of Souls, which he is connected to. So he's a receiver and a transmitter of illumination. So he needs to receive inspiration from the hierarchy and go forth, consequently, to inspire others. In order to inspire others, I guess we ourselves need to be inspired as well. So seek this inspiration and go forth, bringing it to others as well. To hold the vision of the plan before the eyes of men. For where there is no vision, the people perish. So hold that vision of the plan before the eyes of men. The vision of the plan as you understand it. Through your ashramic affiliations. The master with which you are affiliated and the plan itself. Then to act as an intermediate group between the hierarchy and humanity, receiving light and power, and then using both of these under the inspiration of love to build the new world of tomorrow. light and power, inspired by love, building a new world. When we look out upon the world today, we see many issues and problems. But let's not fall into the trap of focusing on that but rather becoming inspired and holding the vision of the new and true which will come to fruition as the current cycle of destruction ends. So work in the present 
for the future, aware of the past. And then to toil in Pisces, which is the past in a sense, illumined by Taurus and responsive in degree to the Aquarian impulse coming from the hierarchy. So in a way we can say that Pisces here represents the past, the past age of Pisces where we have spent more than 2000 years seeking now illumination through Taurus and becoming responsive to the influx of Aquarian energy and the impulse of those energies coming from the hierarchy. Responding thus to the Aquarian impulse as it comes through the hierarchy, through the ashrams. So these objectives are not only individual objectives, but the goal for the entire group. All who respond to the life-giving force of Aquarius and to the light-giving force of Taurus can and will work in the new group of world servers, even though they have no occult knowledge and have never heard of their co-workers under that name. Forget this now. So all who respond to the life-giving force of Aquarius and the light-giving force of Taurus can and will work in the new group of world servers. Let us do our best to be thus responsive to the life-giving force of Aquarius and the light giving force of Taurus. So we can do our part in this current cycle. Now to another very specific statement from the book Esoteric Psychology, Volume 2, page 105. It says that in December 1935, the energies of Capricorn were augmented by the pouring in of forces from a still greater constellation, which is to our zodiac what the zodiac is to the Earth. So we understand what the Earth is, we kind of understand what the Zodiac is, but we may have difficulty understanding what this a still greater constellation is. And I may have some thoughts on this, and let's just move forward to see if we can come to a better understanding of this. So we have a still greater constellation which stands to our zodiac as our zodiac stands to the earth. So there's something here greater than even our zodiac that we need to somehow understand more about because that still greater constellation, which gives the energies and the augmenting forces at this festival week, which energies we need to be responsive to and aware of. By means of this augmentation, during the coming Aquarian zodiacal cycle, groups on Earth can avail themselves of the tide of Capricornian influences, which will flow into our radius of registration, 
every seven years. So breaking this down a little bit, we see that he is here talking about the occurrence of this augmentation as related to the Aquarian zodiacal cycle and seven year cycles as well because its occurrence in 1935, 1942, and then every seven years uh, following that, the last time being in the year 2012, and thus following seven years onto that, takes us to our current year of 2019. So, the occurrence of this augmentation is dependent upon, I would say, the Aquarian zodiacal cycle and this, the, this fact of the seven-year cycles. Now, the seven-year cycles are themselves connected to the seventh ray of ceremonial order, ritual, magic, and creative manifestation. Every ray has its own particular ray cycles connected to it. And it is the seventh ray which is connected to cycles based upon the number seven. Seven year cycles, 70 year cycles, 700 year cycles, 7,000 year cycles, etc. And the seventh ray we have come to understand is the ray which is coming into manifestation together with the age of Aquarius. So during the coming Aquarian cycle, of more than 2,000 years, the seventh ray will be the ray accompanying the Aquarian zodiacal energies. And it just so happens that the modern planetary ruler of Aquarius, the planet Uranus, carries itself the seventh ray through its very own being. It doesn't necessarily always happen like that for the different ages, but if we consider Neptune as the modern ruler of Pisces, and Neptune is a six-ray planet, and during Pisces the sixth ray was governing the ray cycles, then during Aquarius and Uranus being the ruler there, and it being on the seventh ray, it does coincide on these two ages at least. But I would say that that does not always correlate. It does happen for these two ages, however. Reading on, it must be remembered that from certain angles, the circle of 12 signs or constellations constitutes a special unity which revolves within our universe of heavens as our planet revolves in the center of our circle of influences. Now, this is a very important statement which he gives because it gives us a little bit more understanding of the relations between uh, the Earth to the zodiac as the zodiac stands to a still greater constellation, perhaps. Because he speaks here of the zodiac of 12 signs or constellations as con constituting a special unity revolving within our universe of heavens. Just like our planet revolves in the center of our circle of influences. So the Earth is, so to speak, at the center of our zodiac, which is created through the movement of the Earth around the Sun, 
thus seeing the pathway of the sun related to constellations in the heavens, which then becomes the circle of the zodiac. Now in a similar manner, our whole solar system, which should we say, which relations between earth and sun in our solar system creates the zodiac, we can say that our whole solar system, which is thus one with the zodiac, itself has a relation to something much greater than itself. And we will try to discuss what that can be. Continuing with this quote, he says that this week a group occurring every seven years will run from December 21st to December 28th. And if this should at any time fall at the period of the full moon, the opportunity will be most significant. So this week of group impact is this time in the year 2019, not falling at the full moon. It does, however, fall at the new moon, which is the opposite end to the full moon. And it's not only a new moon, it's also an eclipse occurring at the same time as the new moon. And because it's a new moon, it means that the sun and the moon join together as seen from the vantage point of our planet, the Earth. The sun is thus eclipsed. And an eclipse is a very significant phenomena related to the impact of energies onto our planet, the Earth the impact of energies related very much to the first ray of will and power, kind of volcanian being the planet, sacred planet, conveying the first ray of will and power within our solar system. Pluto being the non-sacred planet on the first ray. So these eclipses are rhythmic, rhythmically occurring and impacting life and form expression on Earth, trying to mold it to a higher will. And thus we can understand how significant it is that this week of group impact occurs at the same time as a solar eclipse and a new moon. And I would say that's certainly on par with a full moon occurring at the same time. So this is a great opportunity for us, therefore. So he says that this possibility must be watched this week should be regarded as preeminently the festival week of the new group of world servers. And after 1942, advantage must be taken of this period and special preparation made. This fact invites the attention of all of us. So we're all trying to do our best in order to prepare for this week. And I'm just trying to add a little piece to the puzzle in terms of what are these background energies that are uh, augmenting uh, the expression of Capricorn during this week. So 
So we are moving from Pisces into Aquarius. It is a transitional period of approximately 500 years. And most likely we are still in this transitional period. And maybe something like 400 years of that period have gone. And maybe the year that was suggested in some of the materials related to the disciples of the Tibetan, the year 2117, holds a key to the understanding of this transitional period as ending by that time. We are thus very close and we certainly can feel the influx of the energies of Aquarius, although much of the old Piscean structures are, are still with us, and which tendencies we see all around us coming to the fore even, but coming to the fore to crystallize, ready for destruction. And that, with the help of the energies of Capricorn, which is the preeminent sign bringing about crystallization so that destruction and removal of the old forms can take place. And we see a stellium now being created uh, in Capricorn, and this is all part of this uh, energizing of Capricorn and the eventual crystallization and destruction and removal of the forms standing in the way of the influx of the new energies and the work of the new group of world servers. <clears throat> so we can here see, uh, or maybe the next picture is a little bit better, how the vernal equinox point uh, at the cross point of the lines uh, here is moving towards the edge of the territorial area governed by Aquarius and how it is also moving towards one of the fishes which is called also the circlet because it's connected by stars in a circular manner. This circlet is also uh, symbolically seen as an egg, which is to be hatched, which carries the new, which is to be born in the age of Aquarius. So you can see here how close we thus are to this egg and the breaking and the hatching of its contents into birth. And here you have a wider picture of the area of the sky. There's much to say about this, but we need to move on. So related to the idea of the vernal point, the vernal equinox moving into the constellation of Aquarius, we have to think that there's a vernal point or vernal equinox and there's an autumnal or fall equinox creating a, a, a line. And then 90 degrees off from that line is the solstice axis of the winter solstice and the summer solstice. These four points, the equinoxes and the solstices, create together a cross, a major cross, which is basically the cross of the earth, if you will, indicating the cycles that we go through as it moves around with respect to the zodiacal uh, constellations. So when the vernal point is moving into Aquarius, it just so happens that the solstice point is in itself moving with respect to 
other constellations. And the solstice here is on Sunday, December 22, 2019, 419 Universal Time. And that time, when we look at where the sun is found then, during this Aquarian cycle, which is starting, the winter solstice, you can see here the yellow dot on the green line, the green line, which is the ecliptic. You can see how that yellow dot is actually not only connected to a green line, but also connected to a blue line. That blue line is the galactic equator. So, during this Aquarian cycle, in the beginning of the age of Aquarius, there is this unique alignment and setup occurring in the heavens between the ecliptic and the galactic. Here we have a closer picture. You can see how the sun is actually connecting to both the ecliptic, the green line, and the galactic, the blue line. Here, even closer. And just to contrast things, well, this is, first of all, even closer. So to contrast things, this is the position of the sun for the winter solstice this year, connecting both ecliptic and galactic wheels and dimensions and spheres. Contrasting this, and by the way, looking a little closer, Contrasting this, if we go 2,000 years back in time to 19 AD, in the age of Pisces, you can see that the yellow dot on the green line down below, in the tail of the Sagittarius constellation, has now moved to a very different place. It is quite far away from the galactic equator. So, in the beginnings of the age of Pisces, there is no such alignment between the winter solstice sun and the galactic wheel. In the same manner, if we go 2,000 years ahead in time from current uh, date into the year 4019 and thus into the age of Capricorn and its beginnings, we can see that the winter solstice sun is also far away from the galactic equator and here you see it in the pincers of the scorpion and the scales of Libra, far off the galactic wheel. So this is all to say that there is a unique alignment occurring when the age of Aquarius is upon us, where the cross point of the winter solstice connects with that greater wheel, which is the galactic wheel. And we have to remember that our sun is traveling through space, carrying our solar system along in its sphere of influence. And it's moving around our own central and conditioning star, which ha it has been rightly presumed 
exists in the constellation Taurus, the bull, being found in the Pleiades, the seven sisters of the Pleiades. So this is a statement taken from the book Esoteric Astrology, page 111, which thus singles out the importance of Taurus and the constellation of the Pleiades, which is a constellation uh, found in the neck of the bull. Now, scientists and astronomers may not completely agree with this or understand the meaning of this yet, but suffice it to say that the Pleiades are, in a manner of speaking, the hub of the wheel to which we belong as a solar system. I can't elaborate much more on that right now, but you can meditate on, on that statement. What astronomers do understand and do see is our relation of our solar system to the galactic center. So our galactic center, we understand, has an attractive power on our solar system and we move around the galactic center in great and long cycles. What we need to understand, however, is that there is a very tension between our Milky Way galaxy, which is white or silvery in color, and being thus representative of the mother and the encircling arms of the mother, just like the Pleiades, which are somewhat closer to us in this part of the galaxy, represent it like an outpost, the galaxy itself and maybe the galactic center as such. And thus it also holds the energies of the galaxy itself and plays the part of the mother to us. And this is also interesting to consider because the sign Capricorn and its opposite sign Cancer are known <clears throat> as an axis, parental axis. And that makes for an easy connection and understanding the relation thus of Capricorn Cancer to the galactic and also the mother aspect as represented by the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters as they are called. And particularly the star Alcyone, which is supposed to be the foundation star of the Seven Sisters in the cluster of the Pleiades. Now there's a 60 degree angle between the uh, solar system as the planets move around the sun and the movement of the solar system around the galactic center. So we are somewhat tilted with respect to the galactic wheel. <clears throat> and that is also an understanding that can be important to have. So what you can actually speak of is that we have an ecliptic zodiac created by the 12 rather well-known 
uh, constellations of the zodiac from Aries to Pisces, uh, created through the means of uh, the Earth Sun movement with respect to the background constellations. But then again, we have another wheel which is created by the movement of our solar system around the galactic center. Now that wheel, which is in the galactic plane, we can call the galactic zodiac or the cosmic zodiac. And <clears throat> yeah, here is a quote by the Tibetan. He, he, he tells us that in the understanding of the significance of the distinction between constellations as galaxies of stars and signs as concentrated influences will come fresh light upon the science of astrology. Now, this is a statement which contains many layers of truth, I would say. One relates to the um, dichotomy of the tropical zodiac that we know of in the West <clears throat> and the sidereal zodiacs that are preeminently used in the East. But it also uh, carries other meanings and connotations, one which uh, actually relates to the idea of the importance of the galaxy itself. And further, the understanding that the seven stars of the Great Bear or Ursa Major are involved in an intricate relation with Ursa Minor and the Pleiades. With this we shall not deal, he says. This major triplicity of constellations has a peculiar relation to that great being to whom I have at times referred as the one about whom not can be said. All that can be hinted at is that these three galaxies of stars, the Great Bear, Ursa Minor and the Pleiades, are the three aspects of that indescribable absolute monad, the ineffable cause of the seven solar systems, of which ours is one. Okay, so this is also a very rich statement, but the point made here at this moment is that he's calling these uh, three constellations, Great Bear, Ursa Minor and the Pleiades, uh, three galaxies of stars. And they are galaxies of stars by that definition. So it's a generic term in certain ways, this galaxies of stars. So the important thing that is coming from our reasoning here is that our solar system is moving through space. And that space which is moving through are the waters of galactic space. And that the waters of life in Aquarius are very much connected to the waters of the Milky Way galaxy because of its life-giving ability and potential. Our solar system is moving through an environment within the galaxy which is nourishing and sustaining and providing of life, energy. And Aquarius is particularly responsive to those energies. The two wavy lines of the sign Aquarius connect very directly with these waters of life that the Milky Way galaxy is. And here we have more statements regarding Taurus and its relation to uh, 
it as being the central group of the Milky Way. There's also a connection between Taurus and uh, uh, sorry, the Pleiades and Aquarius, but we can't go into that right now. Just uh, adding to the picture here of relating different signs that are active with respect to this augmentation uh, during this festival week. So here we have a picture of the Pleiades, the cluster. We see the two uh, parental stars, Atlas and Pleione on the left, Elcyone at the center, then Merope, uh, rather somewhat below, Seleno, and uh, we have the two Asteropes, we have, um, what's he called now? Well, two other stars there that for the moment uh, escape me, uh, Taigata being one of them, and yeah, the other one will come back to me. Let's treat it as the last feed for the moment. There it is. Ah, sorry, I, I didn't mention Maya. Maya, of course, is uh, the one uh, there as well. So the sisters dancing and swirling. These are the names of them. Now, there's an interesting connection here between uh, the Pleiades and uh, Capricorn. You know, one of the three extra zodiacal constellations connected to Capricorn is the dolphin constellation. And there is a relation between the dolphin constellation and its ability to marry and relate and unite um, and uh, certain aspects of the Pleiades, which I hear uh, make look like a, a dolphin, actually. This ability of the Pleiades to, should we say, arise out of the cosmic waters in new locations, depending on where they are needed. Because it's a very young constellation. These are blue-white supergiant stars that are quite young stars and don't live very long. So like a dolphin jumps up and we can see it above the waters, it goes down below the waters again until next time it jumps and we can see it. So there's a very close connection here between uh, Capricorn, the dolphin constellation, and the Pleiades. That needs to be understood somewhat. And in the galactic wheel, there is the correspondence to constellations found in the zodiacal wheel. Now, this is a science in itself, and the basis of the understanding of the three crosses in astrology and the three levels of consciousness in esoteric astrology can be derived from an understanding of the interaction between the galactic wheel, or wheels, should I say, and the ecliptic wheel. On this picture, you can see one constellation related to uh, the sign Capricorn. On the right, you can see uh, the constellation uh, above the zodiacal sign or constellation of Taurus. Now, above Taurus there and above the Pleiades, which are found in the neck of the bull, we have a constellation called Origa, the charioteer. And this is thus one of the constellations connected to the galactic wheel and the galactic zodiac. This galactic wheel and galactic zodiac 
is encompassing of our little solar system. So this galactic dimension and wheel is a much greater wheel than our zodiacal wheel and is inclusive of that. And the constellation of Auriga belonging to the galactic wheel can thus be considered a still greater constellation within that greater wheel, which is the galactic wheel. And here you see the rest of the constellations related to the galactic wheel. Now the connections made here with the zodiacal signs is on the hierarchical level and thus on the cardinal cross. So Auriga the charioteer, which uh, you can see here above Taurus, above the Pleiades, next to Gemini and next to Perseus, is like a, an extension of Taurus, you might say, because they even share a star, which is El Nat, which is a star in the horn of the bull, Taurus. Now, this constellation of Auriga is also connected to the idea of the goat because it carries the goat on one of its shoulders. Auriga the charioteer, you might see here where Capella is found, the star Capella, there is uh, indicated a goat and two kid goats, two kids there as well. So Auriga is thus also suggestively connected to the goat and the goat constellation and thus to Capricorn. It even carries the sign with it. And this constellation is very important in its relation to Taurus and suggestively also to the new group of world servers, which need to move forth and go forth, if you recall the statements that we looked at earlier. And this charioteer has this power and potency to move and be active because it has a profound relation to the third ray as well. And thus sets things into motion, rotary motion to begin with, uh, and with the aid also of the, the powers of Vulcan. It has the power to give the initial thrust or, uh, yeah, energy that is needed for something to begin to move, to start on its true journey into manifestation, into being. So this constellation has this ability and we can thus invoke the energies of this constellation in terms of it, it, its power to make things move and go forth. Thus uh, strengthening us, fortifying us, moving us forward by the means of its energies. And, and the whole idea of, of, of the goat and the kids here connected to the charioteer is the relation of the master to the initiate, to the disciples and aspirants. This whole chain of relationship and urge that comes from deep within the spiritual hierarchy and beyond via the masters, the disciples, and the aspirants related to that. 
they all thus can move together and as one, united as the five-pointed star, which this constellation also is symbolized by, coming thus under the influence of the fifth ray and of the planet Venus, which is playing the part of the soul aspect of our Earth, thus coming with its inspiring energies, Venusian energies, reflected in, our, in the fifth kingdom, the spiritual kingdom and the spiritual hierarchy of our planet that is bringing us into touch with the Venusian sphere of energies and thus bringing us into touch with our own soul of the planet Earth at the same time. This bridging is part of the work of the new group of world servers. In a way, humanity is the Earth and the spiritual hierarchy is Venus. And the New Global World Servers need to bridge between the two. So this constellation of Auriga, the charioteer, is very much connected to Taurus, to Venus, to Vulcan, the rulers of Taurus, and also to the Pleiades in a very profound manner, also related to the idea of the horn of plenty, so that when the horn of the goat Amalthea was broken off, and you have basically the initiate, the unicorn portrayed, and the abundance of spirit and soul uh, presenting itself. This being the nurturance and life-giving energies related to what Aquarius also is carrying in his urn, and the Pleiades provide for the soul and spirit as it is brought into Man manifestation. So here we see the two eyes, the Venus Mercury eyes of Origa, the charioteer, and Perseus, the warrior prince, connected. And as they are connected, light flows in. Illumination is the result. The two eyes are one, the eye of the bull. And when thy eye is single, all becomes light. So, These are some of the thoughts that uh, I would like to share with you. There, there's a lot more to say, but this is probably what I would like to share with you at the moment. Um, don't have exactly the time here, but let, let's go over to uh, you, Alexander, and, and see where we are with things. Thank you, Nikos. Um, there are a lot of seats and keys for reflection. I suggest mm -hmm. we take it into our meditation. And um, would you lead us in some silent space to re reflect on this, that we could hold this? in the group space, what you just shared. Yeah, okay, we can do a little something. How are we on time here? I don't have the time here. 
Um, we uh, exceeded our time originally. We uh, suggested that it would be uh, one hour. We we'll already go one hour at 12 minutes. So I, I think we would have to wrap up at some point soon. But I think there are many things been shared. And but please sense the flow and um, if you can. Yeah lead us in some kind of reflective space to do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I could do that. I don't know if there would be any burning question, uh, you know, that, that someone would like to ask, uh, or, or any, any clarification what we've talked about. I mean, um, maybe after meditation, uh, those who would like to stay a little longer and uh, have some uh, sharing, we could have that extra time. Uh, just with the respect to uh, other time commitments that people might have, I suggest yep. we structure our flow like that. That's good. That's good. Okay. So uh, we'll have a brief little reflection here on what we have discussed. So let's just settle down and reflect a little bit on the festival week, the upcoming winter solstice, and how unique the alignments are for the winter solstice now in the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Understanding that the sun at the solstice is not only entering into the sign Capricorn, but is at the same time connecting with a much greater sphere of influence which is the galaxy itself, which we as a solar system is moving through. Do you see our Earth connecting? with the other planets in our solar system, circling our own little star, Sol, the sun, forming its own solar atom, a sphere in itself, influenced by the zodiacal energies, And we may reflect upon the truth of the opposite sign to Aquarius, the sign Leo, being governed by the sun, the sign Leo, which is related to the idea of the self, the I, the I am. The I am that, am I. The many levels of identification and how that identity is held within our solar sphere. The unique identity of our own solar system. Which system is the expression of the cosmic ray of love and wisdom? And moving through space, the waters of space of the galactic environing energies 
represented in this case by the opposite sign to Leo, that of Aquarius with its two wavy lines, representing the nourishing, sustaining, and life-giving energies of Aquarius that are beginning to flow into our sphere, the Earth. so that even the earth may become a water bearer. As it may align with its soul nature, a second ray soul of love and wisdom. We feel the beauty and the love of these alignments of which we are part as humanity, as disciples and initiates, part of the new group of world servers. Inspired by these energies, we align with the galactic field we open ourselves up to that much greater field of influence and relations. And we recognize the energies of the mother outposts of the Pleiades in the neck of the bull constellation governing the new group of world servers inspiring them, bringing light and sustenance to them. And the constellation of Orga, the charioteer, bring unity amongst the ranks of hierarchy, the new group of world servers, and humanity. and bringing momentum to the work and the going forth with a vision held, inspiring those we touch on our path. So we see these energies augmenting the constellation of Capricorn at this unique time, the beginning of the age of Aquarius and the festival week of the new group of world servers. May we thus open up to this greater whole of which we are a part and see humanity do likewise with the aid of the new group of world servers. So let us sense the flow, the stream of energy entering through the crown. And the heart within the head. Connecting the throat and the heart within the torso as well. Holding the alignment between these higher energies and centers. Making them magnetically attractive. with profound loving wisdom, 
drawing to themselves, to ourselves, the forces and the energies of the lower centers of the base of the sacral, of the solar plexus in its higher and lower parts. And upon the breath, we draw into the higher centers those energies of the lower centers that are now ready to come in touch with those higher energies of that greater whole. And as we see the lower energies and forces come in touch with the higher ones, polarizing themselves in the higher realms, we see also the plan. emerging into the minds of men. Inspiring them. Directing their efforts towards the light, the life and the love from which we originate. And so may the blessings come to all reach the little ones during this special time and connect everything as all is related and one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. It's a journey that we, we will be together through the next seven days, and we invite you to join this inner field of the group holding this connection that we just experienced together. We call this a subjective festival week retreat. It can be called any name, but it's in, in effect, it's holding our connection with a wider group of world servers and being op open and receptive to the ideas and impressions that come. Regardless if this or that theory is right, the process of the group endeavor to connect with the truth and penetrate there is what is more important during this festival week. So let's maintain our connection and there will be a number of webinars during this week where when you, uh, we invite you to uh, join us.
2025 initiative will be organizing a um, number of uh, webinars and uh, but among them there will be webinars that will be happening every day at the same time uh, at noon uh, GMT it will be half an hour silent meditation which will be focused on each of seven rays and starting with the uh, focus on energy of synthesis and the, uh, the first meditation, which will be tomorrow, December 21st at noon GMT. Let us know if you didn't receive information about, we will send it to you directly. And besides that, we will have uh, daily webinars uh, organized by different groups where 2025 initiative will work as a host or um, co-organizer. Um, so tomorrow's webinar will be a webinar with the uh, planetary prototype uh, system group. Um, Antonella Nobile will share with us with uh, um, and joined by uh, several um, uh, colleagues and uh, that webinar will be I'm trying to find now the right slides to show uh, cannot see it but um, it will be tomorrow at um, please uh, remind me uh, Claire and Daniela what time is it now because this uh, even uh, evening GMT webinars will be at different times. So I'm blanking now about the time for uh, tomorrow's webinar. If you remember, please tell me, tell us. Look, looking for it as well, just a minute. Thank you. And uh, tomorrow there will be a global meditation at uh, 8.30 p.m. GMT, uh, organized by the Festival uh, Week Preparation Initiative. Uh, please join. That will be silent meditation preceding the global silent minutes at 9 p.m. GMT. Uh, that information is available on a number of uh, resource places, including the Festival Week Bulletin Board. So, Daniela, do you have time for tomorrow? Yes, um, it's at 6 p.m. GMT. Yes, so tomorrow we start at 6 p.m. GMT, and before that, at noon GMT, we'll have a silent meditation. Correct. Thank you. And now, if you have more time, we invite you to stay with us and uh, ask your question. Sorry, Nicholas, I had to mute you. There were echo coming from you. Um, so if you have anything to add, or um, we can open a floor for some sharing. If anyone wants to uh, share anything, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. So, uh, Christine, please unmute yourself. Hello. I'm having a difficulty with the time frame for the Eastern time zone. Um, I was given two times for today, which would make me late by one hour, <laughs> two o'clock. So I need this recording. Will that be available? Uh, yes, this uh, recording will be available um, on our YouTube channel within 24 hours and we will be trying to do something new this time. There is such thing as uh, our channel on GoToWebinar, so it's uh, most likely will be included in our mailing right after this uh, webinar. Okay, now she, she just said 6 p.m. GMT. 
the previous information that I got was at 1530. Uh, that would make it 330 our time. I'm using five hour difference. What are you using? So um, 6 p.m. GMT, that would be 1 uh, p.m. Eastern. Okay, so you're using six hours. Or you're using five, are you using five hours then? I cannot <laughs> answer that right away. Uh, In other words, there's five hours difference between Eastern yes. Standard Time and, and GMT, yes. yeah, and, and GMT. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm just saying, I just received previous to this 1530, which is 330 our time in New York time. I don't have all my information in front of me, but I keep getting, that's why I'm trying, trying to ask, you know, what's, what are you using? Uh, for instance, the seven rays, if that starts at uh, noon GMT minus five, <laughs> uh, that's seven o'clock in the morning at New York. Mm -hmm. So here now on the screen, I'm showing the schedule for this week so you can look at it. And I invite well, you to check uh, a website uh, uh, time converter. I'm sorry, but I had to hand write all of this stuff down. It's at my computer. I'm not at my computer, but I had I could not print it off the site. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm not that dis techy, okay? But I'm yes. saying I, I have had problems trying to get this information squared down because of you know, conflicting times. And I don't know who, who else missed the first hour today because, you know, we were given 2 p.m. New York time. Um, yes, it's one of the challenges for us to live as a global group, uh, living in a different time zones. Uh, well, it's not a problem so if, it, yeah, if, if I, if I so know. I, if may, I suggest, Christine, we can discuss it offline. Uh, if now suggest to focus on the substance of what's been shared. Okay, if, I sent I sent you an email. You, so you, yes, I did, and I and I didn't get a reply. Yes, this is very intense information, and and you know it needs to be inculcated and try and move this through our daily life, but the amount of energy that this requires is being distracted by what I have just covered. So I, you know, I am a Scorpio on the, <laughs> I am very intense. I am on the 29th degree, which makes me very occult. So this is where I'm coming from. And I do appreciate all the effort, but I, you know, I'm also a Capricorn moon, which means I need this information solid. So, blessings Thank to you. all of you. Thank you. So, tomorrow webinar will be at 6 p.m. GMT, which is 1 p.m. Eastern Time. The same as it was today. Is there any... Uh, comments. So, Joe uh, writes, thank you, Nicholas. Could you add some more ideas to the Capricorn stellium and the energies available as the stellium takes shape? No, I wouldn't go into that uh, specifically here now. Only respond if there were any other thoughts regarding what was shared. Yeah, there, there might be some more um, uh, on that at the webinar tomorrow with uh, Antonella. So please join us tomorrow, Joe. Uh, 
I don't see any other raised hands so far and uh, comments are not it's more about the logistics of the process that we are receiving now There were also some questions about um, the existence and location of Vulcan. Mm. It's a, it's yes. a question, question from Sindar Chene. Mm. Well, Vulcan is uh, supposed to be an intramercurial planet uh, revolving inside the orbit of, of Mercury, thus between Mercury and the Sun. Uh, it may have um, a period which could be somewhere around 20 days, let's say, like an example. Mercury has a cycle or a period of 88 days. So that gives you a little uh, understanding of that it moves closer to the sun than Mercury does. But we don't know the exact period for Vulcan and its revolvement uh, around the Sun. There have been uh, sightings of it, uh, suggestively, uh, but no coherent ephemeris has been created so far, I would say. Um, so it's still somewhat of a mystery and eludes us maybe in the same way that the higher will, which the sacred first-ray planet Vulcan represents, that higher will also eludes us. And when we are ready for that will, Vulcan will appear and present itself in a manner in which it has not done so far. I would say, as I did during the presentation, that its energies are present during eclipses. So, in that way, you can perhaps approach its energies somewhat more easily. Hey, anything else? There was, uh, again, one more question from Sinda as well. Can you please provide the source of this wonderful depiction of the galactic center so that we may have a link to it? Uh, let's see, which was that? Uh, what was it one of the pictures, you mean? or? I believe that the question came, yes, when you were showing the uh, galactic uh, will, one of the earlier pictures of that. Uh huh. Galactic. Let's see. And uh, while, while you're looking for that image, uh, yes, you can share your screen again now, Nicholas. So. Uh, yeah, I want to apologize for the mistake that we had in the announcement. Yeah, we had the right time in GMT, but we had a mistake in the um, local times given for New York, London, and Geneva. Uh, okay, so. Is this what we are referring to, the Galactic Center image, or...? I think the before that, so that image, uh, that question came when the, one of the earlier images was shown. Not sure. Yeah, I think we missed it already. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cinda, if you can, maybe uh, uh, we could unmute you that you could uh, specify your question, we're not sure.
And uh, if anyone has any other comments or questions, let's bring them forward and I think we will be ready to wrap up. There are two raised hands. Okay. So uh, I'm unmute, Katya. You're self muted, it means, Katya. Katya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> hello, Nicholas. Hi, everybody. Hi <clears throat> well, I mean, it's, um, I don't really have any particular questions, just my observation is that when uh, the work you do um, is really deep and um, they basically send us on a journey, <laughs> in a space journey. And then I guess it might take some time to precipitate with the questions and just bring it in because it's the magnitude of what you're talking about is it's really, it's hard to to bring down to the mental plane, you know. <laughs> but um, I just uh, want to say that the overall approach, the the path of approach, I, to me, it's invaluable. It's it's something very specific, although it might sound completely highly abstract, and it it is highly abstract. But yet, at the same time, it's extremely specific connection with that energy. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, well, of course, your this needs to be listened again to and uh, pondering and meditating. But um, the specificity and ac access to this approach, to this energy, is um, timely and graceful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And yeah, everybody. Great to hear. Thank you, Katya. Thank you. Hello, gentlemen. Um, my name is Michael. I, I don't usually speak up on matters like this, but uh, I, I kind of have to. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone knows the history of the planet Vulcan. I, I've looked into this, and Vulcan was invented by science, of all things to explain the orbit of Mercury, because it would not make sense using Newtonian physics. When Einstein's theory of relativity came around, they were able to explain it and no longer needed the planet Vulcan. In DK's time, this was not known. So I have a little trouble with accepting this. I can believe it's a hypothetical planet, but do you understand my position? Yes, yes. And, you know, science says one thing one day and another thing the next day. So things can shift again, I'm sure. That's true. So, so, so uh, to me, I only try to connect with the, the energies uh, of Vulcan you know, whether or not there is a specific body or not. At this time, I'm just trying to understand what they are in my own life and in the world in general, and try to see if they're real or not. And in my experience, they are real, whether or not that planet exists there as we hypothesize or not. So that that is my approach uh, to that uh, issue uh, at this time. Very good, thank you. I have another question. Don't mind, it's kind of brief. Um, I also have trouble as a life-giving force. And I believe in being positive, you know, in the face of adversity. But if we were to measure the, the total of biomass at the ingress of the age of Pisces compared to the ingress of the age of Aquarius, we might see an increase in technology, but I don't think we would see an increase in biomass. 
especially given the accelerating force of global warming. I think we are kind of not looking at reality when we think this way. Again, I'm sorry to say this, but with five planets near Capricorn, I feel I have to say something. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, again, to me, uh, I would say that the energies of Aquarius are very real on our planet at this time, and so are those of Pisces. And, and to me, we do seem to be in a transitional period where the energies of Aquarius are presenting themselves little by little more and more. Exactly where we are in such a transitional process is, uh, as, as a whole, uh, can be debated. But you could also say that you, you have your own uh, movement to make from Pisces to Aquarius individually as well. So we will, all of us, each and every one of us, face decisions where one way represents Pisces in the past and another way represents Aquarius and the future. And as we make those decisions and move forward on our path, we will eventually see us moving more fully into the age of Aquarius as individuals. And that may be very different from one individual to another, I would say. So that's a brief comment on your remark there. And I would suggest to bring this type of difficult questions to reflection this time it's, I, and consider this not as just a question to Nicholas but for all of us and not just this question uh, any type of difficult questions it's it's very good time to bring them up or to the meditation uh, and ask our own intuition what is our reflection on that and that's again invitation for the our group meditation during this festival week. Hi, John, you're unmuted. Oh, thank you, Sasha. It's John Horan, and I wanted to thank you for your fantastic talk, Nicholas. I wasn't looking at the screen as you described the galactic center, but I did my best to visualize it. What I found so Intriguing and uplifting is the 60 degree angle you describe between our plane, the plane of the ecliptic and that of the galactic center. 60 degrees, of course, one sixth of a circle, a sextile, considered to be a very advantageous positioning. I was able to picture it somewhat in my mind because we know from looking at the stars at night when we see the Milky Way stretched across the summer sky, it is at an angle, not 90 degrees straight up and down, but arcing across. And I think there's a lot of depth in that particular relationship between the plane in which we find ourselves and the plane in which the galaxy resides. Therein lies a mystery. Much contemplation is required. And I thank you for your talk and look forward to hearing it again. Thank you for that feedback, John. Thank you. And, and I agree with you. Therein lies a mystery indeed. And uh, let's just say that our solar system is not in alignment with the galactic uh, wheel at this time. Uh, for various reasons and uh, we may go through cycles as a solar system where our solar system revolves and at certain points in time will align with uh, the galactic uh, equator. Uh, again, science knows too little of the, these cycles but um, I wouldn't be surprised if 
those were found at some point that we do have such a relation also to the galactic uh, equator. Thank you. I don't see any more raised hands and there was comment from Risa that Please let's hold our focus on the festival week and our work of preparation. Yes, Risa, thank you. Indeed, indeed. So, Nicholas, I would invite you for any last comments before we will close our work today. Well, just to, during the week, try to carry an openness to those energies that stand behind Capricorn, Taurus, etc., and see what comes through for you. I've given some suggestions and try to open for discovery of your own in this way. Because I think the responsiveness and openness to those energies can make this week a more effective week in terms of ourselves finding out what we are supposed to be doing and also getting the energies needed to move in that direction and going forth. So with that greater openness and, and knowing, maybe that can help us more consciously thus work with the energies become occultists in the process and move forward together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And we'll continue this sailing through the stars and through the cosmos in this beautiful celestial ship. Whenever it's available, please invite us. I will. Yes, Elton. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for uh, staying this long with us today. Please check for more events that will be happening every day, organized by different groups. You can find that information on the Festival Week bulletin boards. You can see the uh, link in the chat window and you can see the bulletin board in the, uh, on your screen now. Thank you and let's continue this journey together.